Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mohammed Tabakoli, the inaugural director of the Elohe Omidyar Mir Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies at the University of Toronto. I welcome you to the 2024 Aziz Ahmad Memorial Lecture featuring Professor Supriya Gandhi of Yale University. We thank Dr. Gandhi for accepting our invitation and joining us today. Professor Gandhi will speak on, on Munshis and their successors, the fraud genealogies of modern Hindu thought. The lecture will be followed by a Q&A session, providing a unique opportunity to engage with Professor Gandhi in an academic discussion. The 2024 Aziz Ahmad Memorial Lecture is co-sponsored by the Center for South Asian Critical Humanities at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, the Office of Vice Principal Research at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, the Iranian Studies Student Forum, and the Encyclopedia Ironica Foundation. In addition to our sponsors and Bilal Hashmi, who has organized today's session, I'm grateful to the Roshan Cultural Heritage Foundation and Dr. Elohe Omidyar Mir Jalali for their exemplary support of the Institute of Iranian Studies. At the outset, I'd like to express our collective and individual gratitude to Canada's indigenous people and acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto and Elohe Omidyar Mir Jalali uh, Institute of Iranian Studies operate. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Vandat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of Credit River. Today, this meeting place continues to be the home to many indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live, learn, and teach under ancestral homeland. Before introducing our speaker, I invite Professor Rivon Sandler to speak briefly about our former colleague, Professor Aziz Ahmed. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor uh, Tabakoli, and uh, I'm extremely pleased to be able to speak um, a few words about uh, uh, Aziz Ahmad's uh, personal history, uh, including his uh, work, uh, his academic work. Um, Aziz Ahmad was born in 1913 and uh, died in 1978. He grew up in India in the southern state of Hyderabad. He graduated from Osmania University in Hyderabad with a BA with first class honors in Urdu, Persian, and English. In his early 20s, he went to England to study at the University of London. He graduated with a degree in English literature. He returned to Hyderabad to teach English at Osmania University and became a professor in the Department of English. He spent nine years in Pakistan. He became a leading figure in the group of progressive writers in Urdu as a novelist, literary critic, poet, and translator into Urdu. I, I should make clear that in the troubles that were in uh, India, he moved uh, to, to Pakistan. Um, he became a leading figure in the group of progressive writers in Urdu as a novelist, literary critic, poet, and translator into Urdu. Among the works he translated is Romeo and Juliet and Aristotle's uh, Poetics. When he was 36, Here's the information. I was worried that I left it out. When he was 36, he moved to the newly established nation of Pakistan and became a civil servant and director of publications and films for the Pakistan government. He returned to academic life 
and the government chose him to enter the London School of Oriental and African Studies as a lecturer in Urdu as well as Islam in India. While a member of this university, he wrote Islamic Culture in the Indian Environment, published by Clarendon Press, which was at the time um, he died. It was in his fourth edition. He also published articles in European journals. He came to Canada at the invitation of the University of Toronto in 1962 in what was then the Department of Islamic Studies, which has gone through many changes of name and is now the Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilization, uh, their present uh, department's name in uh, the University of Toronto. He became a full professor and spent the rest of his life writing and teaching. Professor Ahmed wrote creatively as well as for an academic audience. He is most known for his scholarly works on history written during his tenure at the University of Toronto. Uh, so that although he wrote in, in uh, uh, he wrote uh, 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 in creative, uh, he wrote creative works, he is most well known for these uh, works. And the following titles are his scholarly works written during his tenure at the University of Toronto. And I've just um, made a list of them and told the titles because I think it's of interest, uh, his range of uh, scholarly interest and um, and uh, his is uh, uh, his uh, his his uh, ability to uh, roam uh, uh, in uh, in uh, many different ways. Sayyid Ahmad Khan, Jamal Adin Al Afghani, and Muslim India, which was published in 1960. Studies in Islamic culture in the Indian environment which was published in 1964. Islamic Modernism in India and Pakistan, 1857 to 1964, which was published in 1967. An Intellectual History of Islam in India, published 1969. Muslim Self-Statement in India and Pakistan, 1857 to 1968, which was published in 1970. Uh, Religion and Society in Pakistan, published 1971. And this is like a, 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 like a, a roaming child in a way, a history of Islamic uh, Sicily in 1975, uh, for which he uh, was awarded a prize by the um, Sicilian government. Uh, I think Ahmed's teaching in the Department of Islamic Studies at the University of Toronto, which uh, covered 1963 to 78, focused on, and I will give you some direct information, focused on Persian language and literature, and the courses he gave were in Indo-Persian uh, poetry. He also taught courses in Urdu language and literature, with courses in the Urdu language and the history of Urdu literature. His courses in the history of Islamic India and Pakistan included cultural history in Muslim India, Indo-Muslim historiography, and Islamic modernism in India and Pakistan. Oh dear, I'm waiting. Um, uh, he served as a thesis supervisor during the early 1970s on topics which span the mid 14th to the mid 20th century. And I'm just going to tell you about one particular uh, uh, thesis supervision, as that was mine. Uh, Professor Ahmad was my thesis supervisor in what was then the Department of Islamic Studies at the University of Toronto. Um, and um, the PhD 
saw, which I uh, was one of the students that apparently during the 1970s, he was, was when it was his heyday of, of uh, thesis supervision. And uh, my doctoral thesis was religion and politics under the first two took looks as viewed in the contemporary traditional sources with special reference to bear on me. A long, long title, but, uh, and it was a long, long process. <laughs> uh, but I want to stress that Barone was a scribe in the court of the Tugluk, uh, Tugluk rulers who wrote in Persian and all the documents I worked for, I uh, worked with for my thesis, um, including uh, the um, sorry, including the uh, I it um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, including uh, writings of Sufi saints uh, at the time, which I was very interested in. But Professor Ahmed was a uh, uh, I, um, uh, devoted uh, to history. And that's uh, what his interest was and what he wanted me to be interested in. And so I, I, I did, I was interested in it. But that the writings were in Persian, where I was very grateful as I had developed an enduring keenness for the Persian language and Persian culture and society. So I was able to honor that in some degree. A few de details about his life outside academia. Apart from Urdu, Aziz Ahmad counted Persian as one of the languages he spoke and write, wrote in fluently and focused on translating. He was a prolific, prolific writer of non-academic works and published five collections of short stories and 10 novels. Uh, a book called The Shore and the Way, which was by him, was an English translation of his work and it was published in 1971. And I just have to add another um, personal note that I remember him uh, telling me that and he was very proud of, of that and cited it. So I, I, it made me remember him very well sitting in the office that we were in uh, when uh, we worked together. Uh, in Canada, Aziz Ahmad continued to take an interest in Urdu literary activities. He held literary gatherings at his residence and attended Urdu events. I think it was um, it, uh, 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 outside uh, Toronto, in, uh, in, I think in, in the US particularly. Um, some of his letters written from Canada to colleagues in India have been published in Urdu literary journals in Pakistan and India. He was honored in a volume edited by two University of Toronto professors titled Islamic Society and Culture, Essays in Honor of Professor Aziz Ahmed, which came out in 1983. And to bring this to an end, I will say that he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1976. He was a family man, married with two sons and a daughter. His early death in 1978 was unfortunately due to illness. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Sandler, for your moving and highly informative uh, reintroduction of Professor Aziz Ahmad. Our speaker today, Dr. Supriya Gandhi, is a historian of South Asian religions, who teaches in the Department of Religious Studies at Yale University. She's the author of The Emperor Who Never Was, Dara Shukuh, in Mughal India, which was published in 2020 by Harvard University Press. 
She's, she has also written seminal articles and essays on a variety of topics, including Persian rendition of the Ramayana, Persian writings on Dharma Shastra and Vedanta, imperial approaches to comparative religion, discourses of racialization and caste in Mughal India, the rise of scriptural Hinduism in the 19th century, and Hindu nationalism. Her current book project draws on a corpus of neglected Persian and Urdu works to explore histories of religious universalism and secularism in modern India. Professor Gandhi grew up in India and studied there as well as the United Kingdom, Iran, and Syria before earning a doctorate at Harvard University. Grants from Fulbright and Mellon Foundation, in addition to many others, have supported her exemplary research. Professor Gandhi, thank you for accepting our invitation and welcome to Toronto, please. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's such an honor to be speaking with you today. Um, bear with me for a mi minute while I... Um, oh. Yes, it's absolutely visible. Wonderful. Uh, so let me again uh, thank Professor uh, Mohammed Tabakuli, uh, Mr. Bilal Hashmi, uh, for this, and and the others who were involved in this event for this very kind invitation. Um, it's again, it's an honor to speak with you today. It was lovely to um, hear the biographical uh, sort of note about Professor Aziz Ahmed. Uh, I'm so very pleased that uh, Professor Ahmed's family is here. And I regret very much that I'm not there in, per in person, but I've been able to sort of glean a sense, even over Zoom, of this amazing Persianate Canadian hospitality. So thank you. Now, I first encountered the remarkable scholar and literateur, Professor Aziz Ahmed, through his richly detailed and magisterial book, Studies in Islamic Culture in the Indian Environment. I read it years ago in India, while I was hoping to pursue graduate work in Islamic studies. And recently, while revisiting this work, I was struck by a section in which Ahmed discusses some Hindu historians of his time and their differing approaches to the history of Islam in the subcontinent. Now, in what follows, I'm going to begin with Ahmed's comments on this matter, which I then use as a point of departure for a further inquiry uh, through a Persianate lens into modern Hindu thought and its complex genealogies. Uh, and I just I must add as a caveat that I'm building on the work of previous scholars, including Professor Tabakuli's pioneering work on Orientalism's Genesis and Nisia, as well as the important work of Professor Carl Ernst. Okay. So uh, back to uh, Aziz Ahmed. So Ahmed distinguishes between various streams of historiography by Hindus. In the first category, which he terms eclectic, are figures such as Tarachand, who's a scholar hailing from a family of munshis uh, and who edited Persian writings on Hindu themes and also served as an ambassador to Iran. And Ahmed remarks that Owing to Tarachan's almost embarrassing liberalism, Tarachan subordinates historical data to his thesis showing how strong and integral has been the influence of Islam on Hindu culture in India. Now, also in the same category for Ahmed are Nyan Chandra, who, who's written um, extensively on Aurangzeb's patronage to Hindu temples, and Bikramjit Hasrath, who penned a study of Dara Shuko's writings. Ahmed draws a direct line between these historians and 18th century munshis or bureaucrats who were skilled at composing insha or ornate, pro ornate prose and his epistolography. He identifies these historians as the modern successors of these earlier munshis. Um, but uh, uh, in Ahmed's schema, not all the Munshi's successors embraced this generous outlook. In his view, uh, Jadunath Sharkar and Ishwari Prasad formed a second category of historians exhibiting a Hindu bias and sense of grievance. According to him, they followed after certain 18th century Munshi's 
such as Lakshmi Narayan Shafiq, who famously penned a biographical compendium of Hindu and Muslim, uh, and Muslim poets titled Gulerano. And finally, according to Ahmed, the orthodox Hindu historians, such as R.C. Mojumdar and K.M. Munshi, tended to view Islam in the subcontinent as, quote, an alien, aggressive, and hostile inter interlude in the millennia of purely Hindu history. Um, and, you know, this is sort of a, a reflection of Sharkar and Prasad's work. Uh, they these historians did not primarily work with Persian sources, but yet Islam and Muslims are an implicit or an overt presence in their writings. Now I'd like to take up over here an important part of Ahmed's observations. That is his invitation to reflect on the links between Persianate and modern Hindu intellectual cultures through the genealogic, uh, gene, genealogical connections that he traces between Munshis and modern scholars. And also significant, I would add, is Ahmed's suggestion that these Munshis were intellectuals in their own right, rather than mere pen pushers in a vast bureaucratic machine, as is often thought. Ahmed prompts us to ask, to what extent did the intellectual cultures of pre-colonial India percolate to the modern period? How do we account for the diverse political positions on the status of Muslims in South Asia held by those Hindus in colonial India who had received a Persianate education? Now in the 1960s, when Ahmed wrote his book, a Persianate education was still a living memory for many Hindus in the subcontinent. Indeed, before the decline of Persian in the 20th century, Hindus had been significantly involved in Persian learning for half a millennium. There are reports of Hindus in government service as early as the reign of Sikandar Lodi, um, sort of in the late 15th, early 16th century. During Mughal rule in the 16th and 17th centuries, several Hindus sought employment in, in this expanded administration. They worked for the state in a variety of roles as scribes, record keepers, and tax collectors, for instance. Those who mastered the difficult skill of composing insha were eligible for employment as secretaries or munshis. When the East India Company sought to consolidate its rule in its early years, it fueled a large demand for Persian scholars. Many Hindus came to work for the government of British India as translators, scribes, judges, or for one of the Maharajas who ruled the princely states subordinated to the British Empire. And in the 1830s, the colonial state drifted away from using Persian as the official language of administration, but even then, several Hindus continued to write in Persian, or they switched to Urdu. Only well after the wars over language raged in the second half of the 19th century did many of these Persianate Hindus make the shift to the Nagari script of Hindi. Until then, and sometimes even afterwards, they read their sacred texts filtered through the Nastariq script and the idiom of Islamic mysticism. Now, this was especially the case for the specific caste communities who came to dominate bureaucratic positions and Persian knowledge. Uh, and these include the scribal caste of Kayasts, as well as Khatris, Amils, Dhusar Bhargavas, the famous um, Munshi Naval Kishore was a Bhargava, and several Brahmin groups, including Kashmiri Pandits. Members of these communities also served in the colonial administration and by the 20th century made up a sizable proportion of the burgeoning middle class. While the spread of Persian at learning aided the flourishing of universalistic humanism, it also reconfigured along caste lines who could produce and disseminate knowledge, including Hindu religious knowledge. Unlike Sanskrit, Persian was not the preserve of an elite priestly class. Indeed, although pre-modern literacy levels were low, Persian knowledge could afford a measure of social mobility to some. But Persian learning also solidified and reinscribed existing social hierarchies, including notably that of caste. Persian was both a cosmopolitan language and a cherished inheritance passed down from father to son. But this embodied knowledge was not merely about individual fathers and sons, and we can see in this image here a picture of a, a Khatri father and a son. Uh, this knowledge was also enmeshed in the consolidation and reproduction of caste through the control of knowledge, and in this case, also employment in the form of certain government posts. 
Now in this talk, um, I hope to offer a way to rethink the legacy of, of Hindu-Persianate learning and hopefully also push past categories such as eclectic and orthodox. Uh, these categories suggest a fixed, stable religious norm, whereas, uh, as I hope um, I demonstrate, such ideas are relational in contextual terms. And I do so by following the trajectory of Persian literate service caste, that's, you know, government service caste Hindus, as they adapted the habitus to the changed sociopolitical orders in late Mughal and in colonial India. And by habitus, I mean the dispositions and the habits of thought acquired through their legacy of Persianate learning. Uh, and, you know, as an aside, I, I want to add here that while the concept of habitus has been much theorized in modern scholarship, notably by, by Pierre Bordeaux, um, it has also had a very long-standing history in Islamic thought, uh, for instance, in the works of Al-Farabi and Ibn Khaldun and others. Now, in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, the Munshi's evolving relationship to a key discourse pervading pre-colonial Persian, write, Persian writings, and that is the discourse of religious universalism. The idea that a common core of truth underlay diverse religious traditions was earlier used to buttress Mughal divine sovereignty and later redeployed by Persian literate Hindus in a variety of ways. And the history of this idea, as well as its diverse implications, I submit, helps us better understand the fraught and complex genealogies of modern Hindu thought. Now, in order to situate my argument in historical context, I offer this roadmap for what is ahead. Drawing on select case studies, I discuss how certain Mughal munshis prioritized an ethical self-cultivation and the idea of universal religion while also carving out a space for identifiably Hindu learning. This was a downstream effect of earlier courtly discourses of uh, religious universalism and efforts to codify a Hindu textual tradition. Next, I examine the role of munshis in the production of colonial knowledge on Hindu religion. And finally, I show how during the colonial era, Persian literate Hindus repurposed their legacy of Persian learning in the service of arguments about true religion or dharma. So we see here, alongside the hardening of religious identities under colonial rule, we see universal religion being reprised as universal Hinduism in the service of a Hindu community. So let's begin with part one. And I'm going to start this section by describing a scene. We're in the pilgrimage town of Haridwar on the banks of the river Ganga in the mid 17th century. So sorry for the slightly anachronistic picture, but I think it still gives a sense. Uh, and there's a spiritual soiree that's taking place. The Mughal Empire has recently been convulsed by a war of succession during which Aurangzeb Alamgir prevailed over his elder brother Dara Shuko, a prince who thought of himself as a philosopher king and who pursued an active interest in Indic thought. A central figure in this gathering is a munshi, Banvalidas, who hailed from a line of Kayast secretaries. Banvalidas, like his contemporary, the celebrated Chandarbhan Brahman, was an accomplished writer and poet who had once been in Dara Shuko's retinue. He was also a disciple of the prince's Qadri Sufi preceptor, Mullah Shah. And on this occasion in Haridwar, Banvalidas learns of an Indic book that plums the depths of true reality. And he describes the event thus. One spring day, when the trappings of mirth had arrived and the doors of sorrowlessness had opened, I had a gathering in Holy Haridwar with special companions and people of mystical knowledge, or Irfan. And on this occasion, there was talk of some Indian books, the Kitab Hoya Hindi, that contained the subject matter of the truth of all truths, Hakikat al A sincere well-wisher from among that group recommended this beautiful tome, this lovely subtlety. Uh, and thus I translated this bouquet of truth and gnosis into Persian from the Hindi language so that the faculty of smell of the true seekers would grow fragrant from the perfume of studying these truths, these hakoyak. And the book in question was the Prabodha Chandrodaya, or Rise of Wisdom Moon, Rise of the Moon of Knowledge, an 11th century allegorical play by Krishna Mishra that conveys the ideas of non-dual Vedanta. Now, Banwali Das's translation was one of several early modern renditions of the play, most of which were composed in Hindi, in Hindi. And in fact, we have some Hindi translations that are based on this Persian rendition. 
But the fact that Bunvaligas could carry out this translation exercise in the mid 17th century rested on a much longer and wider context. A key moment was the political project instituted in 16th century India when the Emperor Akbar consolidated what we now know today as the Mughal Empire. Akbar's court was the center of vibrant philosophical and religious discussions among Jesuits, Jains and Brahmins, as well as Shia and Sunni authorities. Under him, the Mughal court also fueled a dazzling engagement with Sanskrit writings and Hindu thought, producing several Persian renditions of works such as the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, and the Harivamsha. These projects formed part of the way Akbar performed his sovereignty and also became models for future rulers and aspirants to the throne. And furthermore, beyond the court, the Mughal state supported a variety of religious institutions and groups, including Sufi shrines and communities of yogis. The cultivation of what we might today call pluralism emerged out of distinctive historical circumstances. The religious environment at Akbar's court was influenced by the looming date of 1000 in the Hijri calendar, so the 1590s of the, the common era, marking the end of the first Islamic millennium. During this time, there was an expectation that there'd be great change and turbulence. Not only did several millenarian sects arise, but Akbar himself claimed to inaugurate a new dispensation that would promote peace or sulh over dissension. Akbar's model of universal kingship was closely linked to the idea of a universal religious ethos or a norm underpinning superficial divergences in people's beliefs and practices. In this worldview, the enlightened ruler, whom Akbar's courtier um, Abul Fazl portrays as the physician of his subject's soul, shows dispassion but not indifference towards his subject's diverse and often clashing views. And indeed, the ruler actively intervenes to bring about mutual understanding. As Abul Fazl declares in his introduction to the Mahabharata translation that Akbar commissioned, the emperor wished that the revered books of both groups be translated into the tongue of the other in order that both Hindus and Muslims become seekers of God. By decreeing these projects of interpretation and translation, the emperor guides his subjects to a deeper awareness of the universal truth at the heart of their scriptures. Akbar's son Jahangir and his great-grandson Dara Shuko would also actively take up similar models of rulership. Now recall that Benwali Das's comments on the Prabodha Chandro there that we've just seen identified the work as part of a corpus of Indian books, or the Kitab Haya Hindi, revealing the truth of all truths, or the Hakikat al Now, This notion resonates with the idea expressed in a number of Mughal writings that different religions were but manifestations of a deeper verity. And this idea, in turn, built upon a number of Muslim universalistic discourses. Recent scholarship has uh, highlighted, for instance, the prominence of the concept of tahqiq, often translated as verification in early modern thought across the spheres of Arabic, Persian, and Turkish learning. In the Mughal court, tahqiq, as a mode of metaphysical verification of the ultimate realities of existence, played an important role, informed by the monistic school of the 13th century Ibn Arabi and his followers. Other intellectual discourses on universal truth also held sway in Mughal courts, including Ishraqi or Illuminationist philosophy, which followed and built on the works of the um, 12th century philosopher Shihabuddin Suhravardi. Mughal intellectuals elaborated the foundations that Suhravardi provided to articulate a notion of universal truth. In this regard, uh, Muhammad um, uh, Sharif, um, uh, a scholar associated with Akbar's court states, paraphrasing Sohravardi, that all the philosophers, you know, the Hokema, agree on the root of matters, such as the unity of the necessary existent, um, kind of uh, by virtue of itself or in his essence, and the eternality of the world. Now, while Mughal royals investigated truth, Munshis, like Chandrabhan Brahman, celebrated the Emperor Shah Jahan and his empire, while also focusing on their own spiritual refinement. 
When Bali Das too may have assisted the emperor's son Darashuko in translating Indic texts such as the Yoga Vasishta, but by 1663, when he composed the Golzare Hal, he had no courtly sponsor. So we see now that the language of universal religion, which was only recently the idiom of sacred rulership, including the idiom of Darashuko's sacred rulership, now remained the language of cultivating the self through the pursuit of gnosis. Thus, although under Alamgir, um, who succeeded Shah Jahan, patronage to Indic learning waned, several Hindus continued to circulate and also compose Persian texts for their own religious uses. In fact, their numbers increased as more Hindus than ever came to be employed in Alamgir's expanded administration. I must underscore here the sheer reach and profusion of these writings. Even a cursory look at patterns of manuscript circulation suggests that from the 17th century onwards, there's a burgeoning culture of producing, copying, and reading Persian works on Hindu religious thought. While the earlier Mughal projects of translation and interpretation were an imperial courtly enterprise, they exerted a profound downstream effect. Uh, and certain works appear to have been particularly popular. These numbers given here in the slide are merely indicative. They're, they are hardly um, comprehensive. And the Syriakbar figures come from my own counting. And the others come from uh, various catalogs, including the one mentioned here. Uh, and these works, these popular works, include the Syriakbar, the Upanishad translation sponsored by, by Dara Shoko the Mahabharata translation produced under Akbar, the verse rendition of the story of the two lovers Nala and Damayanti by Akbar's courtier Fezi, Banwali Das's Gulzare Hall, and an 18th century work on Vedanta, Vedantsar, or Essence of the Vedanta, attributed to Lala Mansaram. Now, apart from uh, Vedanta and epics, other genres chosen for translation into Persian include translations of sections from the foundation, foundational Vaishnava, though also Vedantic leaning work, the Bhagavad Purana, as well as numerous versions of the Bhagavad Gita, some attributed to famous Mughal notables. Many of these writings investigated concepts such as Tawheed or divine oneness and Hakaik or core truths. Their authors treated these as universal categories about which the Hindu traditions of Vedanta, and to some extent Vaishnavism, had had important insights. Nonetheless, Munshis also used the universalistic languages of, mis of mysticism, as well as law, couched in Perso-Arabic terminology, to carve out identifiably Hindu fields of knowledge. For instance, the Kayast Devidas Sandilvi composed an anthology of Indic learning known as Tariq e Olam, or you know, a Universal of World History, as well as Khulasatul Khulasa, the, or Quintessence of the Quintessence. Its topics range from archery, medicine, Vedanta, the genealogy of Indian kings, to spiritual dialogues and yoga. In an autobiographical note, Sandilvi tells us that he sought out the company of pure Brahmins, eventually meeting, meeting one Swami Nandalal, who helped him achieve Jivan Mukti, or that is, you know, to help helped him become spiritually, spiritually liberated during this life. Another Kayast, uh, Lal Bihari Bhojpuri, translated into Persian a Hindu legal text, the Yagnavalkya Smriti, together with its commentary, the Mitakshara. He was assisted by a Brahmin named Shobha Shankar, who helped him interpret these Sanskrit texts. Bhojpuri, who described himself as a Persophile, a Persian lover of Indian descent, composed this work for people like himself, for the benefit of Indians or Hindus, you know, Hindi on, who did not understand Sanskrit shlokas, and those people who did not know Sanskrit. In translation, this work would be accessible to not only Muslims, but also literate non-Brahmin Hindus invested in defining the boundaries of religious community through law. Here, Bhojpuri also praises Aurangzeb with epithets such as son of the zodiac of the caliphate, binding on the book of Islam, and obliterator of heretical innovation of bid'at, unbelief, and darkness. Now, it's notable here, a sort of just out of interest, that a generation later, Bhojpuri's son, Nekrai, uh, and Nekrai writes uh, a memoir that uh, Alam and Subrabanyam have written on, that Nekrai would also later comment on Alamgir's order to destroy a temple in Mathura built by the Rajput ruler, Bir Singh Bundela. And in his memoirs, Nekrai describes the temple's splendor, but he also invokes a Sufi-inflected language of religious unity to gently critique its destruction. 
Now, after Alamgir, the increasing fragility and decentralization of the Mughal state and the general political turmoil of the 18th century was also accompanied by, as scholars are recently beginning to point out, a massive cultural efflorescence. Scholars have noted the surge during this time uh, in Hindu poets inscribing themselves into the literary history of Persian through composing verse and writing biographical compendia. This is also a time of major literary productions by the Hindu pupils um, of the poet Bedel. And you know, as we know through the, the works of Stefano Pello, for instance, um, we, we, one of these is uh, Amonat Rai Amonat's magisterial translation circa 1733 of the Bhagavad Purana's 10th skandha uh, entitled the Jelveye Zoth or the Epiphany of the Essence. Now, at this time, Persian also served as one of the means through which a growing Hindu bourgeoisie could engage in various technologies of self-improvement, whether this meant perfecting one's poetic prowess or studying the techniques of yoga and divination. And one example is the Muhiti Marifat, or the Ocean of Gnosis, a work composed by Charandas. Dwelling in Delhi and its environs, Charandas built up a following of disciples who belonged to the middle castes and classes. They included the merchant caste of Khatris, Kayasts, as well as his own merchant community of Dhusars. Uh, while Charandas wrote in Hindi, uh, his pupils, like the author of the Mahid, hurled from persograph or kind of Persian literate backgrounds. Uh, and the Mahid uh, sets out to advance and disseminate knowledge of the breath and of breath divination, which it portrays as a key to self-knowledge or gnosis. Now, we don't know the exact, uh, actually, there's a controversy as to the exact author of the Mahid. Uh, but uh, the introduction of the work uh, frames this uh, discussion on techniques of, of divination and breath control uh, with this hadith Qudsi, you know, the Sufi saying, uh, whoever knows himself then knows his Lord. Now the ethos of Mughal universalism did not immediately disappear when during the 18th century, the Mughal empire fragmented and the East India Company made inroads into India. Under British rule for a while, Persian letters received a boost. The exigencies of company service lured scholars and writers to urban areas such as Banaras, Calcutta, and Lucknow. Furthermore, company officials, um, as we know from the works of Professor Tabakuli, sponsored or made use of Persian writings and translations in order to facilitate their control over the administration and legal system. And a famous example is the Code of Gentoo Laws, published in 1776, which Warren Hastings commissioned uh, Nathaniel Brassi Hall had to prepare on the basis of a Persian translation of a Bengali digest based on Sanskrit texts. A Persian scholarship um, assisted colonial officials in their excavation of a history for Hindus and a geography of India. Uh, one such scholar who uh, helped produce this work was a Brahmin called Anand Khan, who relates that in 1779, he left the declining city of Shah Jahanabad and made his way to Banaras. Uh, he was a devotee of Krishna and also wrote Persian verse with the pen name Khwash. In search of sustenance, the Aubadane, as he put it, Anand Khan sought personal advancement at a period when the East India Company combined cultural patronage with ruthless expansion. With the help of the British resident of Benares, Jonathan Duncan, Anand Khan was appointed professor of the Puranas uh, at the newly established Hindu college. In his spare time, he translated into Persian for Duncan several Sanskrit texts, producing them at a rapid rate. And we can see some of the titles here. Um, the techniques and practices of Orientalism were now at a new crossroads and William Jones had begun to disparage the reliance on Persian materials to translate Sanskrit. Um, so we see over here that uh, for William Jones, these translations such as that of Manu are a rude intermixture of the text, etc., that are imbued with the crude notions of the translators. They swarm with errors imputable partly to haste and partly to ignorance. Um, Still, Persian continued as a medium for colonial language production. It was the cosmopolitan lingua franca still and language administration with which company officers like Duncan were far more familiar. 
But even as Anand Khan was preparing uh, these several translations, colonial officials staked out separate realms for Persian, which like Jones, they associated with Muslims, and for Sanskrit, which they saw as the authentic medium of Hindu sacred texts. Despite Duncan's ceaseless demand for translations of Sanskrit texts, Anand Khan Khosh seems also to have composed Persian works on his own volition. Uh, his Masnavi Yakaj Kula takes as a model the famous narrative poem of Rumi and includes uh, in the introduction a nod to universal religion. How, um, you know, so he uh, mentions the different sacred texts of uh, various religious traditions uh, and uh, uh, sort of remarks that in the language of each one did God give his command. Uh, this Masnavi also includes a section in praise of Benares. So you can see that he is um, celebrating the religious diversity um, of Benares, certainly you know, uh, emph while emphasizing the importance of Benares uh, as a sacred place. Um, so uh, sort, of, sort of in the tradition of the Shahra Ashob uh, genre of poetry, listing all the various groups that, that come there, uh, the different, you know, the Sufis and the other types of Hindu ascetics. Um, uh, and then he also kind of comments in Banaras, Don Mabba de Khosso Om, etc. Musalman the Dario de Haq, Hindu Beram. So know this to be Banaras, place of worship of, you know, the elite and the commoners, the Muslim in remembrance of truth, and the Hindu of, um, of Ram. Uh, so he's lauding the city as home to diverse faiths and sects, all engaged in worshipping di uh, divine truth and seeking the same goal of liberation. And the bulk of this work is dedicated to accounts of various sages giving instruction to rulers like Mubarak Shah, Dara Shukur, Ibrahim Adham. And Anand Khan's invocation of this motif is significant because elsewhere he also likens Duncan to a Mughal ruler. So he's embracing the tropes and the ideas of Persianate universalism, while also assisting Duncan in his recovery of ancient Hindu knowledge. Now, the 19th century saw momentous changes. Several Hindu reformist figures and groups propagated a pared down yet universal Hinduism, even as the colonial state shaped notions of Hinduism and Islam as separate and monolithic civilizations. A significant turning point for Persian Hinduism was the composition of the Tawfat al Muvahideen by Ram Mohan Roy, who was a pivotal figure in the global history of Unitarianism, liberalism, and modern religious reform. The Tawfat appears to have been a key moment in Ram Mohan's intellectual journey, even though he subsequently made little or no reference to the work. As uh, this work's title suggests, it establishes the existence of a unitary divine upon whom, the author argues, all religious tradition agree, traditions agree, though they may differ in other matters. And he states his thesis as follows, um, as you can see in the slide. Um, I have traversed the farthest reaches of the earth across plains and mountains, and I have found that the inhabitants of the earth generally agree upon acknowledging the essence of the source of all beings and their governor. However, they disagree in the particularity of his being, and in the various creeds of the principles of the religions and the matters of what is permitted and what is forbidden. Polemical in tone, the Tophet dis disaggregates the belief in the divine from all other trappings of religion, which are in Ram Mohan's view, not only unnecessary, but also harmful. Now I propose here that the Tophet marks a crucial moment in the intellectual history of modern Hinduism. This is in spite of the fact that it does not seem to have had a particularly wide circulation or impact when it was composed. Indeed, its publication falls at the cusp of a transition to English and Bengali as the main languages of the intelligentsia in Bengal, though for a while Persian still coexisted along with other literary languages. Rather, the Tophet is significant because although Ramo and Roy was in many ways a singular figure, it reflects a larger pattern. Its style and arguments, as well as its relatively minor role in Ram Mohan's subsequent career, point to a broader trend in modern Hinduism. Ram Mohan's Hinduism moves away from an earlier tradition of Persian universalism while never completely abandoning it. In other ways, the Tophet offers a way to conceive of modern Hindu thought as both a reaction to and a restatement of Persianate universalism. 
um, you know, again, this is not the only way, but it's certainly one way of conceiving of, of modern Hindu thought. Now, the colonial administration moved to institute English as the official language in 1835. And the movement for Hindus to embrace a Hindi stripped of Perso-Arabic features gained momentum after that. However, with the rise of print culture, many Hindus continued to write in Persian or Urdu. In many ways, um, their writings resist now the embrace of pluralism that we have seen in previous Mughal and early colonial examples. These works target a distinct and specifically Hindu public, which they seek to consolidate into a unified social and political community. Um, even so, they could not fully escape the literary conventions of Persian prose or poetry and the habits of thought essential to their crafting and to the ability to read them. The second half of the 19th century saw a growing demographic anxiety among Hindus in Northwest India, where they constituted now a religious minority, again, uh, sort of aided by uh, uh, kind of new census practices. This was also a time of fierce intra and inter-religious polemic between Muslim Sikhs and Christians and also between various Hindu groups. Uh, and these include Ram Mohan Roy's Brahmo Samaj or Divine Society, which propounded a monotheism stripped of all extraneous beliefs and practices. Dayanand Saraswati's Arya Samaj or Noble Society, which also advocated a monotheistic creed with the Vedas as the core sacred text. Um, and then also proponents of the Sanatan Dharma movement, which sought to protect an ancient tradition. However, their marshalling of the term Sanatan Dharma, which means eternal dharma, um, which is found in Sanskrit texts like, like the Mahabharata, um, sort of the use of this in the service of a pan-India Hindu mobilization is entirely modern. All these groups often clashed with each other, but what they sought to promote in different ways was not just a Hindu religion in the sense of a social institution, it was religion itself, sort of with a capital R, universal, transcendent, and timeless. During this time, a number of Hindu polemical works were published in Persian, as well, including a refutation of Islam and a defense of reincarnation. And a feature of this genre is that the authors um, often promoted a vision of Hindu religion that itself was highly colored by Persianate ideas and history. So for example, Kirpa Ram in his uh, Medina to Tarkik cites Darashoko in an attempt to prove that the Upanishads are an ocean of divine unity or the Bahre Tawheed and superior to the scriptures of other religions. And also along this, um, these lines, a prominent, the overlooked figure from this time is the reformer Kanhaya Lal Alakhtari, um, who was um, based in the Punjab, who was instrumental in establishing the Arya Samaj in the Punjab. Alakdari churned out several Urdu translations of Hindu sacred texts based on earlier Mughal Persian translations, including um, a translation of Tarashuko Siri Akbar. He was concerned that Hindus did not have access to their scriptures the way that Muslims and Christians did, and he found the Mughal Indological project to be a useful resource. Now, Alakdari's arch critic was the defender of Hindu orthodoxy and Sanatan Dharma, or eternal Dharma leader, Shraddha Ram Pilari. And Pilari frequently brandished his knowledge of Sanskrit. Um, again, you know, he was a Brahmin with a knowledge of Sanskrit and his unmediated access to Hindu sacred texts. Even so, Pilari also took pride in his repertoire of Persianate knowledge. An Urdu compilation of his sermons includes a discourse on the ethics of vegetarianism in which he quotes and interprets a verse from the Sanskrit um, kind of legal code or Manusmriti. But following that, he also proffers the example of the etymology of insan, um, you know, a word of Arabic origin meaning human. And according to Pilari, the root of insan is uns, which according to him means love. Therefore, humans should show consideration for the lives of sentient beings and not kill them for food. Moreover, the last work that Pilari completed before his death was an Urdu translation of the Dabistani Mazahib, or the School of Religions, a Mughal era Persian work by, Ozer Ke, um, by a, uh, a member of the School of Ozer Kevan on comparative religion. 
Now, let me include one last example before I end. In 1899, a Kashmiri Pandit magistrate with the poetic pen name Masrur uh, composed a Persian narrative poem with the Hindi title Ahimsa Prakash, or Light on Nonviolence. This is a work exhorting Brahmins, whom it views as the custodians of the eternal dharma, to eschew meat and alcohol. And it concludes with, a, as, we, as you can see in the slide, a triumphant scene of Brahmin scholars deciding that these are forbidden. However, similar to Pillory, Masrur infuses his argument with terms indebted to Islamic mysticism and law, such as the term marifat or, or gnosis, vahi meaning revelation, nahi referring to what is forbidden, and wajib meaning what is obligatory in Islam, in religious law. Now these intimacies between Persianate and Islamic tropes and concepts on the one hand, and the upholding of Brahminical authority in the other, today seem like a contradiction in terms. Yet, as we've seen, they have an internal logic of their own, one that rests on the legacy of a long history of Hindu engagement with Persian. We may contrast Masru's project with, for instance, Anand Khan Khwesh's notion of a universal religion at the heart of diverse faith traditions. Indeed, the causes that figures like Pelori and Masru promote are very specific. They're first and foremost meant to uphold the particular religious position of Brahmins. Yet the internal dharma that they propound is also expansive. It's attested in diverse sacred texts ac across time and place um, in their view, its message universal in nature. The truth that many earlier Hindu writers and poets sought to plumb in these writings reappears in a new manifestation, a truth eternal and universal, but also far more explicitly the inheritance of Brahmins or Hindus alone. We cannot escape our present moment, even as we must seek to understand the past on its own terms. Today, over a century later, most Persian readers reside outside the subcontinent, while across South Asia, a conceptual chasm separates Persian together with Urdu from Sanskrit and Hindi. These languages are generally seen to re represent entirely distinct domains for Muslims and for Hindus, respectively. The power and persistence of narratives conflating language with religious community and nation in the wake of both colonialism and post-colonial nationalisms occlude the existence of Persian writings such as uh, that I have discussed. Most recently, the present government in India has made it a priority to efface or obscure the vestiges of India's Mughal past. To study the intimacies between the Persianate culture of the Munshis and the development of modern Hindu universalism is to name what in today's India has been rendered unthinkable. It is to show that modern Hinduism as we know it has been indelibly shaped by larger culture fostered by a variety of Muslim and Hindu actors. And it is a mode of critique serving to historicize the transcendent mythologies of Hindu nationalism today. Thank you. Professor Gandhi, thank you for your brilliant, enlightening and highly, highly informative presentation. Bravo. Um, if you allow, uh, I would like to invite our colleagues to pose uh, several questions and engage in Q&A. Sure. Let me just uh, stop the share. All right. Uh, so Please, if you have any questions, raise your hand and we look forward to a great conversation. Yes. Uh, Aksha Aurora, please. Hello, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for this very interesting presentation, Professor Gandhi. Uh, I, I was just wondering if um, these translated Indic texts, were they read or um, or discussed anywhere outside of South Asia? And were there, uh, would, there, would there have been any translations of these Persian texts into like Ottoman or any other languages? Hmm. So, you know, I'm not, uh, thank you so much uh, for that question. Uh, and that, you know, it's a great question. I know that there are certain texts that have had a wide circulation, you know, certain works in yoga, for instance, you know, Carl um, Ernst has, has has worked on that. And, you know, they've even reached sort of North Africa. So um, there are some that traveled widely, uh, and there are others that seem to have traveled um, less widely. So I think it's on a sort of case by case basis. 
Shamika Shabnam, next question, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Gandhi, for your very insightful and wonderful presentation. Um, my question was uh, related to something that you said about Ram Mohan Roy and um, the shift from universal religion to universal Hinduism. And um, you had mentioned that there wasn't quite a full abandonment of universal religion, but there was um, mm -hmm. it, there was a um, slight shift. And I was wondering if you could maybe perhaps shed a bit more light on how this universal Hinduism um, differed from universal religion. Thank you so much. Um, and you know that's a, that's a great question. Now, you know, in the case of someone like Ram Mohan Roy, you know, I I wouldn't um, sort of call him, a, for instance, a proto-Hindu nationalist. You know, he was um, uh, definitely sort of a complex uh, figure who was. Um, very, very committed and uh, to a kind of, you know, universalism. He also sort of uh, used the term uh, Unitarian to uh, to describe his work. Um, but I, I get the sense that in some of his his later writings, he's trying to articulate a universalism, uh, for instance, through the Upanishads. Uh, and then he's actually naming that universalism the essence of Hinduism. Uh, and, you know, if not the first, he's certainly an early sort of user um, of this particular term. Uh, so that's, you know, that's that's a sort of interesting um, change, uh, sort of shift that I that I um, identify. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, from Chandini Jaswal, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Professor Gandhi, for this very enlightening talk. I'm a huge fan of your work. This is one of my most favorite books. So thank you very much for writing the book. Uh, Ma'am, with regards to the translations that you mentioned that Akbar had commissioned, uh, how he says that he wanted the other community to know the the works of the X community, to know the works of the Y community. But uh, how re how true is that statement? Was it out of his own curiosity that he's commissioning these works or is it to let both communities know and find similarities between them and promote unity? What was the real reason for commissioning translations of uh, Persian cultures and the Indic cultures? Right, um, so thank you. So, you know, in the case of Akbar, um, though there are precedents for it, we have really the, um, a full expression of a sort of divine rulership and you know a number of scholars have written about that some scholars have kind of you know are um, uh, made the argument that one can push this back to uh, the era of Humayun uh, so in this particular model and it's a model that uh, no doubt uh, is based on a lot of threads and ideas uh, from a broader Persianate discourse uh, on on kingship um, as well as other currents that are taking place in the in the post-mongol period uh, where emperors um, appropriate some of the charismatic authority of Sufi peers. You know, again, we have Asfur Muin and others who've written on this. So in, in this particular model, it's the ruler who can stand outside religion, who can kind of stand above religion uh, and guide his subjects to the truth that is at the essence of their religious text. So the ruler can convene and supervise um, religious disputation, uh, but does not have to sort of be embedded, you know, as a party within it, can sort of stand above it. Thank you. And the next question, Ayelet Cutler, please. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I, I really wanted to hear more from you. It seems, correct me if I'm wrong, but the impression that I get is that most of these um, Hindu scribes that were writing either about universal religion or universal Hinduism were mostly Vaishnava. Um, we see that, you know, as you mentioned in the work of Stefano Pello and uh, this uh, Vaishnava devotionalism in translations as well. Um, where are the Shaivas in this story, uh, if at all? If, uh, have you encountered um, similar discussions or similar commitments to um, discussing Hindu ideas in Persian among Shaivas. I, I only know one um, early 18th century scribe that um, I think was pretty cl clearly exper um, expressing his uh, Shaiva devotion, um, but it's not that common. I, 
I think. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I, I mean, I'd like to, I'd love to hear more. Um, and again, you know, so the big, uh, I have taken various certain selected case studies. You know, I think um, one, it would be a huge endeavor, an endeavor that has to be sort of done on uh, on a variety of people uh, to sort of touch upon, you know, just this this very vast um, kind, uh, sort of expanse of scholarship. Now, in terms of Shaivism, what one would find more commonly is an infusion of Kashmiri Shaiv um, Shaivism. Uh, but in terms, you know, so uh, they might, so in terms of resonance of some ideas from Kashmiri Shaivism uh, that have entered some of these translations. So I think I think that would be uh, an area. And you know, and I see in the comment of um, of Abid uh, Hussain, yes, absolutely. You know, there is that, that itself is a whole vast uh, topic. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, my own uh, work does touch upon uh, um, a number of uh, Hindu Persian writers. In fact, one of the the last example that I gave was indeed uh, Kashmiri. Um, so. So that is where one can see it. Another place where, where one can see where, where one can see it is in the prosopographical um, studies of different um, ascetics, and um, so there are Shaiva ascetics who are kind of more of an object of study, and these are in the variety of illustrated manuscripts that that are produced. Uh, but I would love to hear more, and you know, maybe I know we can be in touch later. Thank you for the great question and response. Uh, Sabah Zahra, please, again. Yes, hi. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Gandhi, for that um, very enlightening talk. Um, I just had a very small question and confusion. Um, so you talked about people translating these texts in Persian and Urdu, right? And I'm just thinking uh, Urdu as a language, right, as it's kind of the development of it coming from Arabic and Persian. And I'm just wondering in terms of the, the the time period that you're talking about, because I mean, Persian is much older. Was there a hierarchy uh, within Urdu and Persian? Because I think you spoke about them kind of um, interchangeably, right? Some people were uh, writing in Urdu and um, Persian. So yes. I'm just wondering about that. Was there a hierarchy in that sense mm -hmm. of that yeah, language? Uh, in terms that's, of um... You're right. You know, that's an interesting question. And it's, you know, it's a question that has, you know, different valences uh, in the literary realm. Uh, and when it comes to writing by Hindus, uh, the reason why I kind of talked about uh, Hindu and um, sorry, um, Urdu and Persian, is that when you see the rise of print culture in the 19th century, um, you know, with a figure like Munshi Naval Kishore, for instance, there are a range of works on you know, sort of, you know, Hindu uh, religious thought or Hindu sort of uh, associated topics uh, that are being produced in Persian. And then there are there are ones that are um, you that are produced in Urdu as well. And often um, this, this, these trends are sort of simultaneous. So in regions such as the Punjab, where because of educational policies, um, Urdu was uh, was highlighted, and Urdu came to be an important medium of instruction, regardless regardless of religious affiliation. So one, you, you know, one had so, um, a flourishing print culture in both. Very good, thank you much. Um, any other questions? It if seems not, like that uh, Dot Gar and VP are not able to communicate. They're they're unmuted, but the sound doesn't come through. So I've encouraged everybody uh, to ask their questions in the okay. chat if that's the case. If he has just posted the question, um, do you think there is a role for the uni for this universalism and intellectual history as the counterbalance to Hindutva? Mm -hmm extremism and rewriting history to erase Islamic influence and histories currently going on in the Indian education educational system. Right. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, so I, you know, I think I see the careful, nuanced and critical study of South Asian history uh, definitely as a counterbalance. So uh, 
a history of modern Hinduism through a Persian and Urdu lens uh, is definitely a counter history to the kinds of narratives that one sees uh, promoted today. So in that way, uh, you know, it certainly uh, uh, could uh, sort of act in the way that you describe. Um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Pragar Shahboz, please. Thank you very much, Professor Tavakoli. Do you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Supriya. Uh, it was an awesome talk. Uh, well, I have some thoughts about uh, the idea of universal Hinduism. Hmm. Uh, it is um, along with um, the rise of universal Hinduism that you mentioned um, at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, we also have the rise of tendencies towards universal Islam promoted by uh, intellectuals such as Erbal Lahiri, which led to the partition um, in 1947 and the formation of the country of um, Pakistan. Erbal promoted uh, the idea that we should return to the era of the golden age of Islam, you know, um, at a time when the Abbasid dynasty ruled over a large, you know, geographical area expanding to the Mediterranean. Um, and I would just like to hear your thoughts about uh, the fact that to what extent do you see this as a response to the rise of nationalism, uh, globally speaking, in the whole world or in the um, uh, in Asia, uh, generally speaking? Or do you see this as a response to the rise of universal uh, um, Islam, ideas about universal Islams at the same time? Thank you. Uh, you know, thank you for that. It's a very, very interesting um, question. So I certainly see the intellectual developments that are happening in the 19th century as um, creating the foundation for a whole range of possibilities. Uh, so some of these possibilities, you know, could point to more um, in, uh, and a more inclusive and ecumenical politics. Uh, and some of these possibilities could point to its opposite. You know, that's sort of the thing with universalism, its promise and its perils. Uh, now, definitely one of the effects, uh, though not the only effect, one of the effects of a more stripped down, um, large umbrella kind of stripped, uh, stripped down universal Hinduism was that it then created the space for the idea of the universal nation. So from a universal Hinduism to universal nationhood, so, so you know, and 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 there one has the foundation for politics like the politics of Savarkar, you know, whose sort of idea of nationalism has been described as sort of radically inclusive. If you fall within any of the categories sort of in it within it, and sort of, you know, bad luck if you happen to be a Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question comes from Professor Marashi, please. Uh, thank you so much. I enjoy the talk and I always enjoy uh, all the ideas that you're engaging with because they're so universal. And I think a lot of us are thinking about similar kinds of issues. Uh, I, I was wondering about in the modern period, um, one new tradition of thinking that you didn't mention, and I'm wondering if there's a place for it, uh, in your discussion is the the emergence of the Theosophical Society. Yes. And uh, we, we tend to, I think, maybe dismiss the Theosophical Society as a kind of curiosity, uh, but never really maybe integrated into maybe some of our intellectual cultural history of this era. Is that maybe something that could have also been part of this reorientation within Hindu uh, modernism of the late 19th century as the, the maybe the Persianate system evolved in some way and Hinduism, Hindu universalism, as you described it, uh, took a new shape. Do you think the, you know, Madame Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society, what role do they play in all this? So uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I think they definitely do play a role. The reason I, I haven't talked so much about them because, you know, I sort of felt that, well, <laughs> you know, leave, uh, leave that, um, you know, to some others and sort of focus on the Persian and Urdu stuff. But uh, they are really important if one is um, looking at a broader history of, of perennialism. So they are um, picking up and repurposing some older ideas, uh, older perennialist ideas and sort of 
reshaping them for um, for, for a new context. Yeah. Okay. Great, and thank you much. Uh, the, Dr. Raza Khan, please. Am I audible? Yes. No, thank you. Uh, I want to begin by congratulating Professor Tawakoli and the Institute for reviving as is Ahmed Saab's legacy and for choosing a very pertinent and suitable candidate for the first lecture. Professor Gandhi, everybody has marveled at the timely value of your work and also your interpretation. I think you're also a good choice because you, like Aziz Saab, is at the intersection of language and history. So my question is slightly broader, and I wonder if you could comment on that, which is to think of this question that we are discussing, uh, would the answer or would the question and the related answer would be different based on how we pose them as historical question or also question around textual reading, uh, which is what a figure of Munshi in that sense embodies. I'm saying this because uh, Aziz Saab is in fact trained as literary scholar, but his work is very historical and historians who are trying to read him for only historical purposes may not sort of engage with the literary argument that he also makes. Mm -hmm. I'm here also thinking of his work on Padmavat, which mm -hmm. is interesting also because he's making us think outside of Persianate debate into question about vernacularism or what India may have meant for the Islamic culture, as he put it, the Indian environment. Uh, so would the question and related debate would also vary in your argument if we were to also bring, as you do with Urdu and other vernacular, is there a way in which the Persian debate around Islam and Hinduism is also a framing in a particular way? That's just a speculative question, but I wonder if you could comment. Uh, Raza, thank you so much, and that's very intriguing. And may I just ask you to elaborate on that last your, that last line a little bit? Uh, or sort of give an example to elucidate perhaps, you know, sort of the difference between say, literary and historical framing. I mean, I'm just wondering, and also because Padmavat is, uh, is a text and that essay is read and read at in different ways. Uh, so how might the literary text also in that reading is turning what Hinduism or polytheism may mean for Islam? you know, in that very suggestive end reading where sati becomes like the ultimate embodiment of a believer. So I think sometimes the existing debate in the Persianate Sanskrit argument is to think of syncretism or dialogue through those cosmopolitan languages, mm -hmm. which are at the end of the day also state languages. But I wonder if the debate would expand if we bring the vernacular universe into this course. Oh, oh, yes, you know, um, so absolutely. And, you know, one thing that I'm really interested in is, and again, I'm I'm sort of not necessarily looking at Bellet, for instance, or, you know, sort of works like the Padmavat. Uh, but what I do really see is uh, a dialogue and kind of interpenetration uh, between Persianate and uh, Hindavi realms. Uh, so, you know, a lot of these, these Persian translations were not only done for reasons of intelligibility. You know, so mm. Banwali Das is translating Gulzare Hal and he's saying that he's actually, he doesn't say he's doing it from Sanskrit. He get, gets someone's help to do it and he says that he's doing it from Hindavi. Uh, you know, even the Dharma Shastra translators, a lot of these um, kind of Kayast and other translators who didn't have access to the Sanskrit are doing it through Hindavi. Now, if they wanted to sort of just read the text, they could be reading it in Hindi. So, but you know, what happens to it when it is when it's adorned or you know transformed uh, yeah. into Persian? So there's certainly you know something uh, something that does happen, and it also gets translated sort of through this lens of mysticism, gnosis, um, and then uh, and one sees that with various Sant communities, you know, especially uh, in merchant communities of the 18th century, that, mm -hmm. you know, there will be, uh, uh, th th there will be a work uh, done in Persian, and it circulates in a community that is also sort of largely, uh, you know, using Hindavi. Um, so, I mean, I think that's uh, this sort of 
um, to capture this uh, complex multilingual space is, you know, certainly not easy. And um, you're right that if one just focuses on um, on a particular language, you sort of lose the sense of this multilingual environment. Great question, and thank you for awesome response. Uh, Dr. Dodyar, could you ask your question? We can't hear you. We, unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Sorry. All right. Akshay Aurora, please, another question. Just, I was just wondering, um, so this like discourse of universalism, like was it, um, was it present or like was it discussed in any form before the Persianate era? And, um, and, or did, did it like uh, come into discussion um, like at a certain point in history? And is there like a link between uh, like universal, like enlightenment universalism and um, the Persianate one? That's a uh, that's a great question. And, um, you know, so part of what I want to do, though, it's I'm approaching this with uh, with a bit of trepidation, uh, is to weave, um, you know, is, is to sort of connect South Asian history to global histories without necessarily using kind of Eurocentric, you know, sort of uh, lenses. Um, so in a way, it is sort of a project of also provincializing Europe, because there's a sense that these these are only, you know, European discourses, and uh, they might have been sort of a bit different in sort of the Persian or um, world or South Asia, uh, but they certainly did Everyone exist. And, uh, you know, no doubt, you know, people like sort of Blaine Auer and others will be able to comment on uh, other discourses of, of universalism. It's something that was not peculiar to, to Mughal India. Um, you know, one of the sort of major uh, influences in uh, Islamic intellectual history is emanationist thought. Uh, so, you know, based, again, based on this idea of, of monism, of, you know, the one uh, and the many. And uh, and this is an idea, you know, so, uh, you know, one of the sort of key drivers of this was the, uh, the translation uh, into Arabic uh, of the theology of Aristotle. Uh, attributed to Aristotle, uh, but but you know so so we, there are so many different currents of uh, of em of emanationist uh, thought that embody this tension between the one and the many, between sort of you know hierarchy and uh, um, uh, as well as a kind of unity that could militate against that. So. Yeah, very good. Uh, uh, Dr. Dodgan now has moved into another room and. And uh, Dr. Dardyar, you want to ask your question, please? Thank you very much. Uh, I have I had a question. Is it possible uh, if we agree that the religion is specifically Islam, it is pluralistic na in nature, and there is a diversification of the ideas? Based on that, can we conclude that we can compromise the electric? ideas and also the orthodox one and the, there is no any dichotomy between them because uh, you know islam from extremist daesh to the liberalist is diversified ideas and it is not just a unique idea and at the same time other religion as well if we assume that and agree with that are there any dichotomy that you said between those two great campus that is eclecticism and also orthodox uh, Hinduism. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, so I think the, the implications of these um, positions are very different. So someone like Tarachand, um, who really, uh, whose historical uh, arguments and analysis and focus you still got to his own politics. So, you know, for Tarachand, who does not believe that Muslims are an alien presence in the subcontinent, goes out of his way to talk about instances of Hindu-Muslim harmony. So in a sense, you know, his sort of politics and scholarship are intertwined in this, in this particular manner. Uh, and absolutely, there is a difference between a figure like him and a figure like um, 
R.C. Mojumdar, who says very openly uh, in his kind of sort of multi-volume uh, history of India uh, that he that he edited, he says very openly that you know he believes Muslims are inherently bigoted and that Muslims are sort of foreign usurpers. So. Um, uh, you know what, what I've sort of one of the things that I that I uh, am interested in uh, is to look at is to see how these very different political positions can also coexist with sort of fairly um, kind of close and intimate um, ideas. So you know that's that's something that I'm interested in. I think um, I see Blaine Auer. Yes, please, Blaine. Yeah, so thank you very much, Supriya. I really enjoyed the talk and a lot of examples that I really hadn't seen of uh, Munshi's uh, before. Um, first, I just want to comment and then ask a question. So um, thinking about universalism, I think, is to think about perennialism, meaning a kind of underlying thought that underneath all religions, there's one true religion. So you could think of Rumi, you could think of other Sufi authors who kind of share this kind of ideology. So there's always this kind of perennialism or universalism that goes back to the even the medieval period. But in the Mughal period, I mean, particularly with Akbar and Dara Shiko, I mean, we have a policy. Yeah. I mean, Muslim courts and Muslim kings and Muslim intellectuals were always, always interested in Indian learning like Biruni mm -hmm. um, and earlier translations of the Panchatantra. I mean, this made it into Arabic so early. But there's something very distinctive about what happens in the Mughal period, particularly from Akbar and then going forward. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, how do we tie this to it's related to the policies of the court? And what balance do we give to we have a pluralistic society um, because we have Sir Hindi and we have Dara Shiko. You know, we have, you know, where do we make the balance in our own writing of history to mm -hmm. say there was a pluralistic climate and then we also had a court that supported that. But we also have the conservative tendency to say, no, Hindus are Hindus, Muslims are Muslims. You know, where do we balance these things? Mm. So you've asked a very kind of, this is a great and very difficult question. Um, but, um, you know, something that uh, that I'm interested in, in looking at is also kind of sort of just shifts in, um, in context, you know, sort of when, uh, when you have, uh, and the, just the, and the complexity of uh, an individual writer's um, location, um, positions, commitments, and so on. So you might have uh, the terms uh, Mughal and Hindu used in an oppositional manner by, by someone, by a Munshi, who is also then kind of uh, internalizing this universalistic idea that was, you know, as you, as you mentioned, so very much um, a Mughal courtly idea, but also a personal ethic that then sort of it's the Munshis who, who are appropriating this and they're often using it as um, uh, as perhaps a method of, you know, political critique as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great question. Uh, Mr. Bahujwala, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I very nice. I of course miss most of it because I joined late. Sorry about that, but it's a very great topic you are talking about. Uh, I had a question. You mentioned I heard you mention Azar Kaivan, uh, and so uh, he was a Zoroastrian. So you know, can you elaborate on connection with Az Azar Kaivan? So you know his. Um, I you know I can't say all that much except that his circle, the circle of his. Uh, kind of followers and associates was quite influential in Mughal India. Uh, and, you know, they, they seem to have had connections with um, Mughal rulers, uh, other, you know, courts in the Deccan and so on, uh, and seem to have traveled, uh, traveled quite a bit. Um, I so, see. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and one can also see some similarities between ideas that are 
prevailing in the Mughal courts and the influence of figures like Sohravardi, for instance, you know, the earlier sort of philosopher, uh, and one sees that in uh, in their writings as well. I see. Also, uh, uh, some uh, Zoroastrian priests, you know, uh, and some scholars were also had joined the Theosophical Society in India. And so mm -hmm. there must have been some good conversations, you know, between different religious scholars over there. Just want to comment here. Thank you. Yes, yes. And I, again, I would recommend Daniel Sheffield's articles on Azar Keban, which are... I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are getting to the end of our session. Uh, I want to thank Professor Gandhi for a brilliant presentation and really, really engaging. And we look forward to having you in Toronto in person. And uh, I just before ending, I wanted to see whether Mr. Ahmad, uh, would you like to say anything? Yes, I would uh, like to really thank uh, you know, Ms. Gotti and uh, thanks for reviving the, uh, the lectures in my father's name um, that was set up. Um, as I said, it's not the area of subject I have expertise in, but I find it very interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Be, and, be remember. My wife, so my wife and I both thank you yeah. for for this opportunity. Yeah. Be remember thank, him. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. And we look forward thank to you. staying in touch with you. Okay. Yeah. I say thank goodbye you. to all. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Remember importantly. A, a pleasure and an honor. It's been so nice to uh, interact with all of you. And uh, as you said, yes, I would love to do so in person. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay happy and healthy. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you. Yeah, thank you very much.